My name is Mark Walsh from Integration Training, and this is a short video looking at why computers screw us up. So I do a lot of work with stress management, with meditation, with leadership. Um, I'm a Buddhist myself, I've studied psychology, and like most people I use a computer pretty much every day. Um, so I'm very interested in why is it that uh, a lot of people I know will finish the end of their work day feeling terrible. So some kind of things I hear people report, and I've suffered from myself at times, would be like aches and pains physically, tiredness, just exhaustion, or a feeling of being on edge, and often both at once, which is a sort of unpleasant combination of being um, like you've had too much coffee and you're a bit anxious and a bit kind of hyper alert, and at the same time drained and exhausted. So that's, that's become the common tradition for many, many of my friends coming out of work. That's just how they are after work. And, and then to make it worse, they're using computer in the evening, say to go on Facebook, clocking another few more hours that's doing the same thing to them. Another thing I hear about is people feeling very kind of, um, like disconnected, disconnected from themselves emotionally, and also from other people having difficulties relating. Also hear increasingly about addictive behaviours. So I've noticed in training the last few years, it seems to be getting worse, people really can't help themselves of checking their phones under the table in the training or going to the toilet every two minutes to check their text messages or, or whatever it is. Um, you know, I'll notice if I'm in a restaurant and my partner will go out and I'll, as they're out, as soon as they go to the toilet, I'll get my phone straight out. Those addictive tendencies. And um, we joke about them, but actually they can get in the way of us being really present for the person we're with, which is a huge gift when we can do that. And also I've heard them reducing productivity in a number of cases at work. The other thing I hear about a lot with computer use is increased conflict. So people losing their sense of empathy and getting involved in what's called flaming or even trolling. Um, you know, if you've seen the comments on a YouTube video or you've um, said something on Facebook you later regret, then you know what that's like. I actually think that many of these factors are resulting in um, some of the serious social problems we see today. And this isn't a small thing, and it's only increasing, it's only getting more so. We are hyper-connected and increasingly will be. So computer use in the modern world is really a perfect storm of a number of factors. I think it's worth separating them out, so because they each have different solutions, and teasing out what's going on. So some of the psychological ones have started to be explored, not by many people actually, but by a few like Sherry Turkle and Larry Rosen, um, some good books by those guys. Um, Wisdom 2.0 is a conference which looks at some of these issues. What I'm going I'm to cover some of those in this video, but also look at the embodied factors which are less well known and, and take this slightly unusual Buddhist perspective. Um, Buddhists really study the mind, it's so really a psychological system and grasping an addiction is, is the nature of what Buddhists study, so it may be useful. Computer use as it currently exists encourages conceptual, abstract and future orientated thinking. Um, essentially what we might just common sense called being in our heads. So this abstract thinking rather than mindful awareness of our senses, if I rub my hands together and feel that for example, or I really listen now, senses in the present moment almost computer, it's almost like the opposite of meditation. So meditation is something which is widely regarded and is a strong evidence base to suggest is extremely good for our health, our emotional well-being, our relationships. It's almost the opposite of that. Computer use really seems to take us away from ourselves. So our basic um, interface, to use computer analogy, our basic interface with reality is feeling, is sensation, is the body. Um, computer use takes us out of feel the feeling body into this abstract conceptual world. Um, and that has some pretty serious consequences. People often have the sense of losing themselves in the screen, they'll talk about, like their consciousness is in the screen. Um, another one I commonly hear is, is what's known technically as, oh shit, it's 11 o'clock. Um, when you check your email, completely disembody, get drawn into this addictive chain of things that you didn't really choose to do. It's just not very smart time management. It just happens, it's done to you rather than being choiceful. And then you're only at 11 o'clock, you go, oh my God, I need a toilet or my shoulders ache or I feel like crap. Two hours of the day have gone already. So this, what we could call dissociative element to computer use, uh, is a lot like what happens to people under trauma and can lead to these problems connecting to their own emotions, connecting to other people, uh, and, and of course, with well-being. So computers give us a response that's like trauma. Sometimes people say, yeah, but books have uh, got lots of information in. Doesn't that um, send people crazy? I think it's much milder for a number of reasons. Um, 
One is that the books tend to be linear. There isn't a sense of having to make lots of choices or being drawn in lots of directions. If you go on Facebook, there's just a million ways your brain can be drawn in. Things that kind of seduce you and they're actually designed to draw you in that way. Uh, this is how they set up, they test this to, to make it more effective at doing that. So um, in that sense, a book is a little different. Another sense that it's different is often online with email and really a lot with social media, we feel socially observed. So this creates, us. there's an excitement in that, but there's also an anxiety. Um, will someone like our status and give us that what's called a stroke psychologically? It actually chemically creates a little hit of uh, various neurotransmitters that were the reward pathway. Similar reward pathways to many drugs and addictive behaviors, we get a little hit that doesn't last long and it's what's called an inconsistent reward matrix, which means you never quite know if people are gonna like it or not. So you, you go on there in the hope that you, that, that you will get that. And those, those inconsistent reward matrix, like a fruit machine, can be very addictive. Um, this sense of being socially observed also creates the social self which combined with grasping, uh, attachment sometimes the Buddhists call it, being hooked is a nice translation of actually the, the Pali word, um, that creates suffering. That's actually the root cause of suffering from a Buddhist point of view. Some other factors include the, uh, what I call the illusion of control, like I'm gonna get through all my email. Um, the illusion of I'll, I'll always be heard without the dangers and the uncomfortableness of intimacy, but I'll always be heard and I should be heard. There's a kind of egoic quality to that, yeah? Again, and I'll never be alone, which is Sherry Turkle's thing, but again, without necessarily having the discomfort and learning the skills of face-to-face, real-time intimacy with someone, which uh, are tricky and those skills take a while, you know? If you remember what it's like to be a teenager, it's not, it's not easy to get, get a good grasp of those skills. Um, so there's a number of illusions that can come Another illusion which from a Buddhist point of view is quite damaging is, is a sense of greed that can develop, the sense that we have to consume. You know, you couldn't possibly in a hundred lifetimes, maybe not a thousand lifetimes, absorb all the information that's on Wikipedia now, just today, and it's growing exponentially, right? So that's just one website. Um, so this can create a sense of, uh, of greed, uh, of wanting to consume. There's that element of consuming information. We, don't, we live in the consumerist age and the information age, so we live in the consumer information age. Okay, now let's move to the physical. This is more where my area of expertise is actually. Um, online, certain senses are involved and certain others aren't. So for example, email, you can see things, but you can't, uh, you can see the email, but you can't see someone's face. You definitely can't touch them. With Skype, you can hear their voice, you can see them, but you can't smell them, you can't touch them, you can't taste them. Yeah, so these are the, the senses. Um, this is a bit weird, because in our evolutionary history, they were mostly connected until we started inventing things like telephones very late in our history. They were always intertwined, and the senses kind of balance each other out. They have um, different qualities. Uh, in traditional Buddhist thought, they're given the qualities of elements, and this doesn't mean they literally consist of fire or earth or water or air, or nothing, this is the other one in Buddhism. It doesn't mean they consist of that, but it means that they have the quality of that. So the, the earthier ones, um, touch and smell, for example, the ones that ground us, the ones that relax us, bring us down, those ones aren't present with a lot of internet communication. The more kind of airy, fiery ones, the more explosive ones are. The earthy senses are also involved in intimacy. So um, this is common sense, and the law, the law shows how common sense it is. I can walk down the street, I can look at someone, because that's not particularly intimate unless I stare for a very long time in their eyes, but generally it's, I can glance, no problem. I'm not usually allowed to touch anyone. I'm certainly not allowed to taste anyone unless I know them pretty well. So um, the senses that are more intimate are taken out of the equation. Um, people can argue this one, I appreciate that senses can be intimate in different ways, though I think the sort of legalistic framework we have shows there is something, uh, something to that. Okay, another one people often talk about is electricity. Now, um, I think the jury's out on this one a little bit of whether the, the physical electricity, just the energy in the very Western sense, whether that makes a difference to us. Uh, I certainly subjectively feel after working on a computer that I've been a little bit buzzed, a little bit electrified. Uh, and I know that splashing water on my face, putting my hands in water seems to make a difference subjectively to that. Some people say you have to take your shoes off and ground on the floor. Yeah, that can, be, that can work. Um, 
the science of this I'm not sure about, so I'm, I'm going to leave that to people better qualified to, to argue. From the point of view of an embodiment training, which is what I am, here's the big one, which is usually so obvious that it's usually missed. We don't move much when we're on a computer, yeah? So movement for a human being is life. We are human movings. This is how we, we sense. If we stop moving, we completely stop. We habituate. Eventually, we can't feel anything. Uh, emotion, um, emotions are movement. So if we're stuck in a chair, our legs are immediately taken out of the equation. Our hands are constrained to be in one place, like physically in one place. Our fingers can move a little bit. Our eyes can't move very much. Nothing much is moving. Um, it freezes us. And I think this is the main numbing factor which leads to these other emotional and other problems that's involved. So this lack of movement is dissociative and that leads to the atrophying of these emotional intelligence, intuitive intelligence, relational empathy, those kind of, those kind of skills and our sense of contact with ourself. So sitting is bad for us. Mostly today people use devices sitting. We may stand and use our devices sometimes. Usually we're sitting in the modern workplace. Um, sitting is really, really bad for us. We didn't evolve sitting in chairs. Uh, and again, sitting still, and also the, just the nature of the posture. So if we look at what a sitting posture is without a chair, you can actually see it. So this is roughly the sitting posture many people are in, leaning forward slightly, uh, that many people are in all day long without much movement. The only difference is I'm having to contract my, my quadriceps so that I can don't fall over. If you just look at this position, it's a strange position. It's kind of curled up. It's not very well aligned with gravity. Um, we'll link to um, a video on better sitting posture so you can sort of see a, a posture that would be more uh, effective and more healthy. I don't want to stay that way for long, particularly if people have what might be called bad posture, which just means that your muscles are working too hard and your bones aren't aligned with gravity. Everything's curled up, the head, the hands, the body's folded, maybe the feet are crossed under the table. Uh, the legs are crossed, everything's curled up like it's the opposite of what Amy Cuddy would call a power posture. So this research in the States has shown that certain postures, more expansive ones particularly, um, produce testosterone which is good for you. So testosterone sounds aggressive, it's got a bad reputation, basically it's a confidence hormone. And being folded up, which for most people is how they spend 8 to 10 hours a day minimum, produces cortisol. This is a stress hormone. This causes various psychological and physical problems. Um, so think of it this way. When you're sat in a chair all day, in, particularly in a curled up or a crossed arm, crossed leg position, you're creating hormones in your own system which damage you. Another factor for many people on their computers is the head tilt. So unless you've got um, your, your computer set up well, most people will be looking down slightly, like if you're on an iPhone or a Blackberry, certainly on a laptop, you're, you're looking down because the screen's by the keyboard. Um, this downwards looking, from an embodiment point of view, this is really associated with depression. You don't go around looking at the floor unless you're pretty sad. So what you're putting in your system through doing this all day long is a sense of sadness and depression. As opposed to being a bit more upright. I don't want to stay that way for too long, it doesn't feel good. This is the critical thing to understand around embodiment and computer use. Our postures, our way of moving, what we touch, this becomes our way of being. These things aren't neutral. It's not just that our psychology affects our posture, which I think is obvious to anyone. It's the other way around too. So um, Amy Cuddy, for example, had people stand in certain power, what she calls power poses, and she measured the, the hormone level in their saliva, and it changed even after a few minutes, let alone a whole day of doing it. So you're actually changing your chemistry, you're changing your psychology, your whole way of being, through sitting in different ways. Another embodied factor is the eyes. So generally our eyes in just in life, walking around, social interaction, we have a sort of reasonable field of vision. If we're in love or we're looking at a beautiful vista, it might, wow, really be able to see far and wide, yeah? So I could see both of my hands now, for example. When we go on a computer, normally we narrow that field right in. So you can probably feel it now just at the camera. If I really stare, at a very small point. It feels kind of aggressive, right? It doesn't endear me to you, I'm sure. We're putting ourselves into a state of fear and aggression when we fixate on a point like that. The only time in nature we would fixate on a point like that is if someone was trying to kill us or we're gonna fight someone and we had to be really focused on a single thing. That's the embodiment that computers are really encouraging us to do.
another factor with embodiment is the type of movement. So most people's movement on a computer is kind of jabby. You're only really doing this and your eyes are darting about a bit. So your eyes are jabby and your fingers are jabby. That jabbiness is a particular way of being, a particular quality of movement, as opposed to circularity, yeah? Uh, like say if you dance salsa or you're swimming in the sea and there's a kind of organic circular quality, it's gonna create a very different way of being. So you've got posture, we've got eyes, we've got movement quality. So also we've got touch, so the quality of touch, what we touch, so something like this, which is um, hard and angular, metallic, you can try this at home, actually hold it and feel. There's a certain, that quality kind of starts to infect you almost. There's a certain response to hardness and angularity and metallicness, which is different than if we say, um, hold something organic, yeah, something round, something smooth, something slightly different. And even more so than if we hold, um, we touch our own hands or someone else's hand, we hold a hand or a plant or something that has a kind of warm, soft quality to it, the organic quality. Um, I think in the future they're going to make computers sound strange. They're going to make them rounder and softer. Uh, simply because it will, will be pleasurable, it will create a different state of being. In it. Other factors of embodiment that are important, there's lots, but um, the hand position. So palms are normally down when we're on a computer. We don't type this way up, we type this way up. T having the palms down creates a kind of authoritarian uh, way of being. If we think of a kind of yang bot embodiment, we've got kind of this authoritarian, ooh, one hand a bit dangerous, this all kind of authoritarian shape, yeah? Whereas palms up is much more of an open state. We think of um, Mary, for example, as portrayed in uh, Christian art, is often this way, welcoming, opening. Um, this way also opens the shoulders, whereas this way rolls the shoulders in like this. I believe it was Nia founder Debbie Roses who told me about that one. So the last physical factor is just that we're physically not close to people that we're interacting with online. So again, some of those senses are taken out of the equation. Um, also the consequences are very different because we can't see the effect our actions are having. So if we're in an argument and we're upsetting someone, you can, they're distressed, we don't have to, even if we hear their words on say Facebook or Twitter, we're not having the emotional felt resonance of what it's like for that person to be upset. And that's what leads to compassion. So interacting over distance can create this emotional distance. It's like um, uniforms can do this in people as well, a sense of disconnection with people so we're not feeling our, our compassion and empathy. So what are the solutions to some of these? So if we look at these as different um, tracks that are there, I mean, I would say mandatory mindfulness, emotional and embodiment training for every school child. And I know I'm biased because this is what I do. And I think these are the skills of the next century. These are the skills that will keep us sane while the world gets, you know, because I love technology. I think that's the, the way the world's going and that's great. And let's have, make sure we have the skills to do that healthily. Um, other things we can look at here. So when I'm online, really getting a, keeping a sense of my own body, I might need to set reminders to do that, like um, interruption software or phone that beeps noticing my butt in the chair, noticing my breathing, rubbing my back on the chair. It's forgetting, so it's, those reminders are really important. Noticing, having a sense of the other person when I'm talking to them, so that I'm, you know, I'm texting someone or whatever it is, imagining them, what's their body gonna be like if they're sad or they're angry or whatever it is, yeah? Keeping that image in mind if I can't actually see them in front of me. Another simple one is taking breaks. So, you know, one way I like to do this is I drink lots of water, so I have to keep getting up to go to the loo every, at least every hour. Uh, that means I stand up, I move, I have a little stretch. Making sure my breaks from work are physical breaks from sitting and mental breaks. So I'm not just going on Facebook for five minutes as my break. If I do that, I'll also stand up and stretch and make the tea and have that physical break. For the eyes, looking out the window, making sure you have that peripheral vision. If you've not got a window by a computer, at least looking across the office. Um, for touch, making sure that, shit that you touch some wood, plants, human beings preferably, some other things that aren't hard and metallic because that will get into your system otherwise. And lastly, I think computers will be designed differently. Uh, you, when we have the sort of Google Glasses technology or the, um, uh, the kind of minority report kind of computers are used with much more movement and gesture, I think a lot of these problems will be solved and more of these problems will be solved if designers take some of this, take the human being into account and build the process and technology around the human being and what human beings like and what nurtures us and encourages us. 
So I'm really hoping uh, that technology people get together with people that understand the mind, like Buddhists and psychologists, people that understand the body, like yoga teachers and embodiment teachers. Um, if the tech people can get together with those people, then I think we've got a bright future and there's going to be some very cool stuff. So if that's you, please get in touch. I'd love to do research on this, to explore this, to make some new designs for companies. I think it could be very cool. Thank you.